All right. So welcome to the nonprofit show. Um, so welcome all the good people that are listening and tuning in, um, whether you're tuning in live or whether you are tuning in to the recording on the back end. We want to welcome you to today's show where we're going to be talking about high performers, uh, and particularly high performers that are turning to consulting practices. So we have Julia Devine, who's the co-founder of Devine Parker, and we're going to be having what I think is going to be an exciting conversation about the landscape in the nonprofit space, um, consulting and what does that have to do with it? And what are the things that we can learn on both sides of this? So from the consultant perspective, what are the things that we can learn? And from the nonprofit perspective, what can we learn in terms of talent development and, and pipeline? All right, so we're going to go ahead and get diving in here. And as we do that, I want to um, mention that this is uh, this show takes place with a panel of co-hosts, and so I'm one of your co-hosts, me, Marco Whitlock, workplace well-being strategist, and also founder of Mindful Techie. Um, but we also have a whole panel of hosts, including Julia, who many of you know. So we invite you to tune into future episodes, as there will be a different set of people every day um, guiding these conversations. And I'm just so excited that I get to be the person to do that with you today. Um, I also want to mention our presenting sponsors that really make this show possible. So we have Bloomerang, we have the American Nonprofit Academy, the Nonprofit Thought Leader, the Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. So we wanna give some love and, and show our support and gratitude to all of our presenting sponsors um, that make this possible. And let's go ahead and, and get moving into today's conversation. So Julio Devine, co-founder, Relatable Nonprofit, RelatableNonprofit.com, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So we're excited to have you here today, but I'm wondering as we get started, if you can just tell the folks a little bit about who you are and what they can expect with today's conversation. Sure, absolutely. So. I've been working in nonprofit organizations in the nonprofit sector since college. I did not go to college for it. Like most people have not. They kind of fall into nonprofit work through volunteering or internships. Uh, mine was a development internship my sophomore year of college, which turned into a grant writing job, which I held for a few years. And then as most sort of careers evolve in the nonprofit space due to turnover, due to changes in the organization. I was bumped several times into a development manager role, digital marketing role, and I eventually ended up as a development director um, it probably four years out of college. So I think that speaks to the nonprofit sector. Yes. <laughs> this sort of jumpy place where you don't have this 25 year arc, but you just go where they need you. And suddenly at 24 years old, you're leading a department of 10 and figuring out how to raise $7 million. So <laughs> um, just what we're talking about today with the, the nonprofit sector and careers and transitions, that was my introduction into nonprofit work. And then during the, the um, pandemic, like so many people, I was talking with my friend and we decided that it was time for us to go off on our own, um, access greater flexibility, a better lifestyle, get away from some of the stress that comes with nonprofit work while staying within the sector. And we started consulting. So we did that for about two years. And then about a year ago, we found an Instagram account that's called Relatable Nonprofit. And this was to talk about a lot of the challenges in the sector through humor, so lots of memes, funny reels and things like that. And it was kind of just a joke at first, just for fun, but it has actually grown to have about 5,000 followers today, nonprofit wow. professionals and organizations. And this led us to actually pivot our services to be supporting nonprofit professionals directly and helping them to access this sort of new way of working in the sector through consulting. So that's what we do now. And uh, I couldn't be more pleased with what we've been doing lately. Well, awesome. And, and what a what a fascinating journey that you have been on. And I, I really I sort of connected to what you showed at the beginning in terms of how you got into the space with the volunteering and it just sort of turned into what I described as sort of the accidental 
fill in the blank, whatever your job title <laughs> is. So it sounds like in your case, you were the accidental fundraiser. Um, yeah. But I know so many accidental caseworkers or so many accidental uh, techies that have sort of fell into those roles because that that's where the need was and they sort of just stepped up to the plate. So um, I think that is so awesome and so beautiful. And um, so why don't we just go ahead and just move this conversation forward. So this stat is so startling to me. So 70%, 74%, if I'm reading this correctly, 74% of nonprofit employees are looking to change jobs. So yeah. can you say more about this? Did I get that right? Can you say more about what, what this means? Yeah, so I was actually just shocked when I saw this study. And anecdotally, I don't, I've already been hearing a lot of this. I know my own experience, you said you're consulting. So I think a lot of people already have an experience that lines up with this, but to see that number was very startling to me and really confirmed a lot of what I'd been hearing. Um, I think a lot of it is still residual from the pandemic, mm -hmm. just the experience that we went through during that time. Uh, I know when I started working out of college in 2018, it was inconceivable that you could work from home or work flexibly. And, and I remember thinking, well, this is just how it is now. I get my two weeks vacation and, you know, welcome to the next 25 years. And then after COVID, um, with the flexibility that people access to just understanding um, not only because of COVID and remote work, but also the opportunities available now through social media and being able to connect directly with people online, you yeah. sort of can bypass the traditional employee relationship that a lot of people have had to use in the past to, to gain employment. So it's not as essential anymore to just be an employee. There's a lot of other things that you can do. So I think people knowing all of this, having lots of skills and knowing how it feels to go into the office in nonprofits that are underfunded and asking you to take on a lot of um, tasks that are really not related to your job description. Uh, you've got kids at home. You've got the economic conditions of just how much everything costs right now. I think people are just really feeling like enough is enough. There's a lot going on and there's just other, other jobs that might be able to serve them better or other working styles that might be able to serve them better. So I think it's very attractive for people right now that they think if I've got skills, there might be something better for me out there. And that's what they're thinking about. Wow. So that's so fascinating. And, you know, one of the, I guess the thoughts that comes to mind is, so as you think about this, is this an all or nothing proposition where people are either having to choose between working in the sector or having their own thing on uh, their own thing? Or is it something where there can be a hybrid approach. And, you know, I, I'm, as you're thinking about that, one of the things that comes to mind is, so there's a influencer that I follow and he talks about this idea that everyone, no matter what sector you're in, everyone should have a side hustle. Everyone has a book or a song or a talk or something that they can share with the world. So uh, yeah. what's your thought on that? Yeah, no, I absolutely think it can be hybrid because everyone is going to be in a different spot. Now, for instance, when, um, I started my consulting firm with my friend Catalina Parker. She was in a slightly different spot than me. She's a few years older than me. She had just had her first baby. Mm -hmm. And for her, it was important to be able to retain her health care and, yes. um, you know, work through some other things that she was doing. She was moving and different things. So when we started the firm, I had already left my job. She transitioned into a different job, which she held for about a year while we yes. were building the business. And yeah. then when it made sense for her, when she actually went out on her second maternity leave, that was when she transitioned full-time into consulting um, and was able to go on her husband's health care at that time. So that's just one situation where I was able to quit sooner because I didn't have dependents or anyone counting on me, uh, right. whereas hers was a little bit different. Now, I know other people who love their full-time job. They're able to scale it back a little bit at work. They might be in this sort of pre-retirement phase where they're in their 50s, early 60s, they're not ready to hang it up and stop working, but they also uh, would love to have this sort of more flexible job that they can take with them when they're snowbirding in the winter, things Absolutely. like that. 
Um, so I think it's going to depend where you are, what your personal situation is, your family situation. But I certainly believe that there is a lot of merit to having that side hustle, even if you're not ready or not interested in building a full-time business anytime soon, even just to have something on the side that you're cultivating is an excellent strategy in case there is a layoff or there is something where you just need to quit. You've got something else to fall back on. Awesome. Uh, so let's dive a little bit deeper into this. Um, so redefining the nonprofit landscape. So I'm curious how you think about this. And I guess one question I have to sort to kick this off is, you know, what lessons can nonprofits who are struggling with attracting and retaining talent, um, what, what lessons can they learn from, you know, your experience and how you're helping other folks that want to actually transition away from a traditional nonprofit role? Yeah, so I think that nonprofits too need to be thinking about how they can better utilize different forms, different relationships with employees that aren't necessarily having a full-time W-2 employee. I think you it depends obviously the size of the shop, if it's a two or three person volunteer organization versus an enterprise level 100 employee nonprofit organization, but you see a lot of waste happening with just a big team of nonprofit employees, but then you have sort of both things happening at the same time. You have overwhelm happening for employees, sure. but then also like wasted time and talent where you've got someone who might be an excellent digital marketer having to coordinate the volunteer department because you don't have anyone for that role. So you're yes. not really getting the best use out of people's talents. And this is where I think nonprofits could benefit from looking into consultants. And I think the, the word consulting is a little bit uh, misleading because I think a lot of nonprofits are gonna think, oh my God, I can't afford a consultant. Consultants are for the very wealthy nonprofits, the top line 1% nonprofits. And that's true if you're going to be bringing in a huge firm that's going to be doing a massive audit of your programs. But these more solo entrepreneur types that are bringing their certain skill set, a specialty directly to the marketplace, and it's their talent. Maybe they're an excellent email marketer, they're yeah. an excellent social digital marketer, they're, they love building volunteer programs or planned giving programs. Yes. If that's something that that person focuses on all the time and they're excellent at it, if you have a choice between hiring someone to come in and build that, and then you're going to dump 20 other tasks on them versus just hiring that consultant to come in, plug and play that program and manage it for you. It might actually be cheaper to go with a consultant who's going to do that for you. And you're going to get more value that way rather than trying to hire someone and then say, okay, now I need to tell them what to do. Yeah. So, so it's a little bit of a, a changing understanding between um, nonprofits and the employees about what consultants are and how they might be able to help your organization going forward as more and more of them enter the sector. And, you know, when I hear you share that, one of the things that comes to mind is it sounds like in some of these instances, part of the issue in terms of maybe mishiring the, 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 the wrong type of person is not being clear on what you want and what you need, right? Mm -hmm. And not being clear on the scope. And so maybe you're hiring somebody for, in your case, you talk about email marketing, for example, you're hiring somebody for a full-time role, but perhaps your organization has that need, but they don't actually need a full-time person yeah. focused on that. You need a, you need someone a couple hours a week that can write out some copy that can help maybe help you set up your your platform that can maybe help you with understanding your metrics and how do you adjust. Uh, but maybe you don't need a full-time person um, to do that. Exactly. So I, I wonder to that point, um, how do you see this? distinction between entrepreneurship, which is like what you're doing outside of a formal organization and entrepreneurship inside an organization? Because I think that there's an opportunity perhaps for nonprofits to create a space where people have maybe more autonomy to explore and to dive into their creative endeavors um, and maybe get the same type of or similar benefit you might get from actually doing it on your own for folks that might actually want a formal organizational structure. What, what are your thoughts on that, on those two sort of ends of the spectrum? Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent point. I mean, not every employee is in a position to turn around and go launch their own business and maybe they don't all want to, but it's worth talking about 
what you see when you work inside probably any organization, not just the nonprofit sector, but with the turnover and with years gone by you, I remember getting certain tasks handed to me when I started as a grant writer. And it was like, I don't know, I had to individually scan every grant and then put it in a manila envelope and put it in the filing <laughs> cabinet. And I remember being, you know, being 21 and being like, what are you guys kidding? And having said to me, well, this is how we've always done it. And well, that's just the person, the person who trained me did it this way. And she said, this is how it's done. So this is what you have to do. And I'm like, yeah, but we could just scan these as PDFs and save them to the CRM and be done. And they're like, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's not, that's not how it was trained to you. So, so having nonprofits have to have, and everyone really has to have, even in a business um, built in periods where you audit your processes and you sit down and say, why are we even doing certain things that we do? And I think that's what happens a lot of times that adds to that burnout and and encumbers employees and stops them from being able to explore and innovate and be these entrepreneurs because they're just saddled with tasks that, oh, well, that just has to be done because that has always been done. Um, So having those built in, you know, at least once a year, if not more, and I know it feels very difficult to do something like that because of the tyranny of the urgent, but if you force your teams to do this and say, we're not doing any work today, we're shutting the phones, we're closed, Yes. just talking about this kind of stuff today, come prepared, I think employees would love that opportunity to say, you know, let's get rid of the filing cabinet or let's get rid of the <laughs> stupid thing that we do that yes. people just assume that there's a purpose for a lot of things that there isn't, there just isn't a purpose for. So, um, you know, building in these opportunities for strategy and for growth and for asking the employees that are there, what would you do if you had the magic wand to be able to do anything? And what would you yes. bring to the table? What would you change? And um, and in the study that actually that we're talking about, they said it's called like um, the chopping block. What mm. would we put the chopping block? Because we just can't do everything. We're spreading ourselves yes. thin. Yes. And we know there's a lot of low value tasks that are just being done to be done. Yes. We could get rid of 30% of those, 40% of those. What could we do instead with that time? Absolutely. And I think, I mean, it's such an important point. I, I feel like I could talk with you for hours about this, but <laughs> I, I do want to move the conversation uh, forward. Uh, so, um, I, I want to, um, at, before we wrap up, just really ask you, uh, sort of a, a, maybe a curveball question or maybe like a strange question. So on the opposite side of this, one of the things I've seen that I was looking at even before coming on today is there are people that actually are in this trend of having multiple full-time roles. Um, mm-hmm. simultaneously. So have you heard of this? And what is your thought as you think about that in the context of the work that you do and your 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 experience? Yeah. So I know there's a couple, like there's fractional fundraising, there's, there's virtual assistant part-time, there's different structures I've seen done. I mean, when we got started at the beginning of our consulting career, we kind of got in that trap where we, we basically offered to perform all of the services. Now I was a development director and Catalina was a program officer at a foundation. So you know how to do a lot. And so you go into this consulting role and you say, oh yeah, I know how to do all that. I'll do all that for you. <laughs> I take on client two and three. And all of a sudden you realize you're in the situation of basically having three quasi full-time jobs. And that's just, you know, it's just not sustainable. I mean, and if there's certain circumstances where you've really dialed in the scope and you're doing very specific things and the hours work for you, uh, I think that it, it is possible. I mean, right now how things are, I don't know anyone who doesn't have some kind of part-time or side gig or two jobs. I mean, it's very, very common and just getting more common. And you certainly don't want people getting stuck in the trap where, you know, they used to make this much money doing one job and now they have to do two jobs just to make the same amount of money. So that's, I hope not heading towards that. Um, But I would say that if you are thinking about consulting, you're thinking about going off on your own or even just doing a side hustle, make sure that you are dialing that in and niching down as much as possible so that the service that you're offering is 
easily replicable and it's something that you can manage on a specific timeline and manage expectations with because if you end up trying to do double what you're doing now or triple what you're doing now and you're saying yeah sure I've done email marketing yeah sure I've done board management yeah sure I've done camp capital campaigns I mean that's wonderful I'm sure you're great at all of those things but you can't do all of them at once a double because all of a sudden you realize you're just tying your labor to the hours you can work and you're not leaving any time to sleep or eat. So you do need to be strategic if you're going to do something like that and only offer something that you can do, you can pace with the actual time that you have and and putting your lifestyle first too. You don't want to be doing 80 or 90 hours a week. Absolutely. So you just gave us a really good tip in terms of for folks that are interested in making the transition. So I'm actually curious, um, and maybe I'll make this out of the last question before we wrap up. So what top one or two things should someone be thinking about before they quit their job if they're looking to go the consulting route? Yeah, so I would absolutely start before you quit if you can, if that's something you can do, set aside time. Um, We actually have a mentorship program for people who are trying to do this. We've just recently launched because we have so many people asking how we did it. So uh, if anyone's interested in that, you can reach out to us. But starting with that business plan, the business strategy, um, starting with your niche, what your services are going to be. And building all of that out, nailing all of that down, and then some of the administrative functions of, you know, opening your business and your bank account, all these things, get that all locked in and start having conversations with people in your network, just 15, 20 minute phone calls with them or Zoom calls and saying, you know, I'm thinking about going into consulting on this specialty what are some needs that you're seeing at the organization you work for? What would what would lead you to hire someone? And just feeling out the market and doing that research. Yeah. Uh, if you're able to, I think giving yourself that three to six month runway and then trying to take one or two on before you transition, um, it's jumping from one moving train to another rather than jumping off the train and then being stuck on the side of the road with nothing. Then it's going to be a little bit more stressful to try to build that consultancy up from scratch. Really solid points. And just one final point before we, before we really wrap, I promise this time. So <laughs> on the organ, on the other side, so if there is a, a nonprofit leader or executive that's concerned about a team member jumping ship to do what you help people do, um, what's one or two things that they can do to maybe begin to make their place of work a bit more attractive and be able to retain talent? Is there like one or two practical things they can start to do right now? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I know, I know for a lot of people, they're really not leaving just because of the money. It's not like the first, I know that's important and it it is a, a factor, but it's not the first thing that comes to mind. It's a lot more the support and the flexibility that they're looking for. So yes. I think executive directors can just sit down with their team particularly those people who are managers, who have pretty nice skills, who it would be very attractive for them to go off and consult and just figure out what they're missing, what they're lacking and what maybe could be done if it's remote work, you know, some kind of flexible work schedule. Um, But another thing that might be a compromise is I've seen a lot of people transition to consultants and they keep the nonprofit that they used to work for as their first client and more or less do the same work for them Yes. But it's on a retainer and it's getting the work done, but now it's tied to the value they're providing rather than to the hours they're working in a week. And yes. I've, I've seen it be hugely successful and it maintains that relationship between the nonprofit and the employee, but everyone gets what they want. Absolutely. And it sounds like you're just inviting folks to be open to different ways to get to the same place in terms of the shared vision or shared mission. Um, that we have in terms of advancing the work of whatever your cause or organization is. So such a powerful conversation, a beautiful journey that you have shared with us. So um, Julia, thank you so much for joining us um, today. So we have your website up for the Relatable Nonprofit, but is there anything else you want to share in terms of how to contact you or stay connected? Yeah, relatablenonprofit.com. You can always find us at Relatable Nonprofit on Instagram. I would be happy to have you connect with me on LinkedIn as well, Julia Devine. And if anyone who is listening is interested in becoming a consultant, I would love for you to reach out and we can talk about if it's a fit for you. Awesome. So with that, we want to, again, thank our sponsors that have made this possible. So we have, again, Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, 
the nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, 180 Management Group, your part-time controller, staffing boutique, JMT Consulting, and nonprofit tech talk. So we want to thank you all for tuning in today. We want to invite you to go and listen to future and past episodes at the nonprofitshow.com. You can also check out lots of great resources at the American Nonprofit Academy.com as well. Julia, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you so much.